Hello, I'm Joe Alino from Vanderbilt University. Welcome to the final session of the 2020 ASHNR meeting. I'm co-moderating this SAM session on maxillofacial imaging with Dr. Nikki Farid from UC San Diego. We thank Ilona Schmalfus and the program committee for the invitation to participate. Thank you, Joe. The speakers are also watching the presentations and are available for questions using the chat tool. Remember to access the SAM questions after the session so you can obtain your SAM credit. Our first speaker for this session is Dr. Christine Mosier from Indiana University, who will be speaking about odontogenic and non-odontogenic lesions of the mandible and maxilla. I'd like to thank the organizing committee for inviting me here to speak with you today. So over the next 30 minutes, we're going to discuss the imaging features of the most common benign and malignant odontogenic and non-odontogenic lesions. And what I'd like to do in the course of this discussion is compare and contrast those imaging features that will help us distinguish the odontogenic from the non-odontogenic lesions. So to begin with, odontogenic lesions are often difficult to identify because so many of them look the same. But if we look at the pathology underlying these lesions, we can identify features that will be helpful to distinguish them. Now, most of the odontogenic lesions are composed of odontogenic epithelium, and as such, will have a more cystic appearance to them. There are a subset of lesions that contain components of dental tissue or ossification or calcification, and as such, will have more of a mixed sclerotic cystic appearance to them. And then finally, there are a smaller subset of lesions that contain mesenchymal tissues, either fibrous tissues or connective tissue stroma, and these lesions will appear more dense or sclerotic. So to begin with the odontogenic cysts, there are a number of odontogenic cystic lesions. We're going to uh, focus our discussion on the more common lesions. So the radicular cyst is the most common odontogenic cyst. This is an inflammatory cyst that you will see at the root apex of a tooth that typically has dental disease, caries, or periodontal disease, and we will not discuss this any further. What I'd like to do is focus on the dentigerous cyst and odontogenic caretis cyst. There are a number of other more rare lesions that we won't have time to discuss today. So the dentigerous cyst is the most common non-inflammatory odontogenic cyst. And this arises because there's a cystic accumulation of the follicle during development. So we're going to see that this cyst is, will attach at the junction of the cementum and the enamel. And that's a key imaging feature to keep uh, in mind when we're looking at these lesions. We see these more commonly where we have impacted or uninterrupted teeth, which is typically the posterior quadrants of the mandible and the maxilla. So if we look at this dentator cyst, we see the cystic mass that's expanding the mandible, not a lot of expansion here. And we look at these soft tissues, windows on our CT, and we see that it's a really hypodense lesion. And the sagittal reform mats here in this patient really show us this ideal version of the dentigerous cyst where we see the cystic mass arising from around the crown of the tooth. Notice that the cyst attaches at the junction of the enamel and the cementum. So classic dentigerous cyst. On MR imaging, on our T1 weighted images here on the upper left, we see that they're T1 hyperintense. This is often due to proteinaceous debris and cont contents within it. It's T2 hyperintense. And of course, on diffusion imaging, there will be no diffusion restriction. The odontogenic keratocyst is the second most common uh, cystic uh, odontogenic lesion. Um, there's been a little bit of a pathologic kerfluffle over this lesion. Um, it's been reclassified a couple of times there. When they started doing molecular profiling, they realized that it did have overlap with a number of other benign and malignant tumors and then called it a keratocystic odontogenic tumor. It has been since uh, been renamed an odontogenic keratocyst in the most recent edition of the WHO. This is an odontogenic lesion. Uh, again, we're going to see these in the tooth-bearing areas of the alveolus where we tend to see uninterrupted or impacted teeth um, more often in the mandible than the maxilla. It's important to remember that these lesions are locally aggressive. They also have a high recurrence rate. And these lesions we will see in association with basal cell nevus syndrome. So odontogenic keratocyst, as we see again, a cystic mass in the mandible. Now this looks very similar to the dendritic cyst that I just showed you. One interesting thing about these lesions, even when odontogenic keratocysts get very large, they tend to, particularly in the mandible, enlarge along the long axis of the mandible. So there's not much medial lateral expansion in these lesions. That's just a feature that we tend to see with them. Now, these are going to, as we said, arise from odontogenic epithelium, but we'll see them encompassing the entire tooth. So not just developing around the crown, but they will encompass the entire tooth. Another patient with a odontogenic keratocyst we see arising from around this tooth. <clears throat> we see on the coronal bone windows that it is expanding along the long axis of the mandible. 
here. When we soft tissue into this, we see that it's slightly more hyperdense than what we typically see with a dense changer cyst, but certainly that will remain on our differential. We should also include, because of the density, uh, benign tumor, the ameloblastoma. A different patient um, with a dynogenic coronacyst, because these are locally aggressive lesions, we do want to look for extra osseous or extra alveolar extension, as we see in this patient with the lesion extending up through the ramus of the mandible. We see dehiscence here. And on our post-contrast uh, CT images, we see that there is extension into the medial pterygoid. In a different patient, we see, again, the cystic mass in the parasymphysial mandible that does has, have extra osseous extension into the gingival buccal sulcus. On MR imaging, a dynogenic keratocyst can be T1 hyperintense, as we see on our T1-weighted images here, and this is due to the ortho and perikeratin, and sometimes hemorrhage within these lesions. And for that lesion, is very, and that, for that reason, it's variably T2 hypointense, as we see here on this image. Again, these lesions we really want to look to for their uh, extra osseous and extra alveolar extension. So particularly in the orbit, we want to look for or those lesions in the maxilla, rather, we want to look for extension into the orbit or into the pterygopalatine fossa. And those lesions in the mandible, we certainly want to look for extension into the surrounding spaces. As we said, uh, adenogenic keratocysts cysts are associated with basal cell nevus syndrome, as we see in this patient with multiple cystic lesions in the max, uh, mandible and the maxilla. We do see these um, in association with a number of other uh, musculoskeletal abnormalities, as well as neurologic abnormalities. Uh, typically, when we do see this, it is a genesis of the corpus callosum. These lesions are often multiply recurrent in these patients with basal cell nevus syndrome. As we see in this patient uh, on MR imaging, again, the cystic mass uh, in the maxilla that's very T2 hyperintense, the thick rim of enhancement on post-contrast uh, MR images. This, we often see this thick rim of enhancement when these lesions are recurrent. And in this patient, we see additional multiple cystic masses uh, in the mandibles that we see here in our T2 and post-contrast images. Now let's turn our attention to odontogenic neoplasms. There are a number of benign odontogenic tumors, um, and we're going to focus on the most common, uh, a couple of the uncommon lesions, and we'll briefly discuss a couple of the more rare lesions. So the odontoma is the most common benign odontogenic lesion. Uh, and this actually spans a spectrum of lesions ranging from hamartomas to actual benign neoplasms, the most common of which is the most differentiated form of this. This is called the compound odontoma. And so this will contain uh, a central focus of ossified tissue where you will be able to identify small little formed bits of teeth. So you'll see crown and roots, and we call these denticles. This will have a loosened, uh, loosened capsule around this. We tend to see these more often in the anterior maxilla, more so than the mandible. The other form of this that we typically see is a complex form. This is a more dedifferentiated form, so there's no really identifiable tooth components to it, but it will be a um, amorphous ossified mass. So compound odontoma, as we see in this patient on our axial bone window CT, we see this mixed cystic and sclerotic mass in the maxillary alveolus, and we see a number of little ossified uh, masses within the lesion. But when we look at our coronal uh, reformats, we see that we can identify formed tooth elements. These are the little denticles. We can see crown and bits of roots formed here. So this is a compound odontoma. The complex odontoma, as we see in this patient, we'll see this more amorphous mass. As we see just this collection of amorphous uh, calcified mass with this lucent rim around it. And we do see that there are areas where we have hyperdensity that corresponds to enamel and to dentin in this patient with a complex odontoma. The ameloblastoma is the second most common uh, odontogenic tumor. This, again, is an odontogenic epithelial lesion. It has several forms of multicystic, unicystic, desmoplastic types. Again, we see these more often in the posterior quadrants of the mandible and the maxilla uh, in an age range that overlaps that of the odontogenic coronacyst. These, again, are locally aggressive uh, lesions, and they do have a high recurrence rate. The multicystic lesions tend to have this classic soap bubble appearance, but and we're looking for additional features in other lesions. The unicystic lesions tend to have mural nodules, which we'll show an example of. On MR imaging, these tend to be a little bit more T2 hyperintense. And on post-contrast imaging, you will see enhancement of the solid components and these mural nodules. Now, these lesions will restrict diffusion. So multicystic ameloblastoma, we see this um, so bubbly appearance to this multicystic mass in the posterior quadrant of the mandible here. Notice that it expands the, the mandible more in a medial lateral um, configuration that we typically see with the odontogenic uh, keratocyst. We see on soft tissue windowing that's a little bit more hyperdense. 
The desmoplastic ameloblastoma, we tend to see more in the anterior mandible. Again, this large multicystic mass with breakdown of the, the bone here, but these large cystic spaces. And the unicystic ameloblastoma with the classic mural nodule. We're looking for extension of these lesions outside the alveolus, as we see here. And certainly, we would look for extension of this mural nodule into the sublingual space here. Now, if we look at this case uh, on our uh, coronal T2-weighted image, we've got this uniform T2 hyperintense lesion. Certainly, we would think about a denticular cyst or a, a donogenic keratocyst. cyst. Again, very cystic appearing mass, a uniform expansion. But when we look at the diffusion restriction, we see here on the ADC that there is diffusion restriction of the cystic lining. So this is, in fact, an ameloblastoma. Another patient with ameloblastoma in our T1-weighted images, we see this T1 hypointense T2 hyperintense heterogeneous lesion. And again, when we look on the ADC, we see restricted effusion. So this is ameloblastoma. Now there is a subtype of the ameloblastoma, the ameloblastic fibro, and these are rare lesions. We see the cystic mass in the posterior maxilla. Notice the medial to lateral expansion of this. This is extending up and pushing up uh, the floor of the uh, maxillary sinus. So certainly a benign appearing lesion, somewhat locally aggressive. When we Hounsfield unit this, we notice that this is a little bit more hyperdense than we typically see with an ameloblastoma, suggesting that there are perhaps some connective tissue or mesenchymal components to this lesion. And indeed, this is an ameloblastic fibroma. What's important to remember about this is, although we don't have uh, calcified tissue, it does contain fibrous components. We tend to see these in younger patients. These are more aggressive lesions. And these lesions actually can undergo malignant transformation, in which case about 10% of them will undergo transformation. Another rare lesion is the adenomatoid adenogenic tumor. This is a mesenchymal uh, lesion. So we see, again, the cystic mass in the anterior maxilla of this young patient. And what you should notice is that there are little flecks of calcification within these. These can be somewhat subtle. When we soft tissue into this, uh, we notice that it is a little bit more hyperdense. Again, in speaking to its mesenchymal components, we see, again, these are benign, locally aggressive lesions. You see this pushing up the canine in these patients. So these are mixed epithelial and mesenchymal lesions. We tend to see these more often in the anterior maxilla, typically in the canine region. Again, younger populations. These calcifications within them can actually be quite subtle. They may just look like tiny little snowflakes or little puffs of calcification uh, that identify these as mixed epithelial and mesenchymal lesions. Now, the last mesenchymal lesion that we'll talk about uh, is the adenogenic myxoma. Uh, as we see in this gross pathologic specimen, this really dense gelatinous tissue, and we see this in the mesenchymal stroma and the histopathology. On imaging, as we see here on our axial bone window CT, we see this cystic mass in the mandible, but you see how this is sort of scalloped along here. We may see a little bit of, of bone reaction here. And then certainly when we soft tissue into it, although we do not have contrast, we see that it is moderately hyperdense. This is more hyperdense than the other adenogenic lesions. A couple of other different patients with adenogenic myxoma, again, cystic mass in the maxilla. We see that it's expanding and eroding outside the maxilla, so locally aggressive lesion. On post-contrast images here, we see that it is centrally mildly enhancing and moderately hyperdense, again, more so than what we see with the other adenogenic lesions. Now, in this patient, we've got the cystic mass in the ramus and the mandible, and although this is kind of mild to moderately hyperdense, it's not that hyperdense. But when we look on the coronal post contrast, or excuse me, coronal uh, bone windows, we see that there is scalloping of the bone and a little bit of reaction, bone reaction here, which is typically seen more often in the myxomas, so adonogenic myxoma. Now let's discuss malignant adonogenic tumors. These are exceptionally rare lesions, and in fact, it's unlikely that you'll even encounter these, generally speaking, in private practice. These are typically a combination of carcinoma and sarcomatous lesions. Now, in this patient, we see the cystic ma uh, mass in the anterior mandible, um, and we see that it's actually pushing up in between the teeth, maybe causing a little bit of resorption here. So it certainly is an aggressive lesion. On post-contrast imaging, we see it's actually fairly hyper-enhancing. Certainly, this is more enhancing than we typically see for ameloblastomas. We do have some extra osseous extension. So while this is an ameloblastoma, it's a little bit more aggressive, a little bit more enhancing. Um, and so we do need to start to think about the possibility of malignant disease, and indeed this was an adenogenic carcinoma. In a different patient, we see again this multicystic mass in the uh, posterior maxilla, so certainly we would think about an ameloblastoma on post-contrast uh, CT imaging. It is, again, a little bit more enhancing than we typically see with these lesions, and on post-contrast MR images, we do see that there is some soft tissue infiltration. Again, this certainly is in keeping with an ameloblastoma. This is a really non-specific appearance. 
But the degree of enhancement and the soft tissue infiltration, again, leads us to consider the possibility of malignant disease, disease and this is an amygdaloblastic odontosarcoma. So now let's turn our attention to non-odontogenic jaw lesions. And there are a large number of lesions, and these include fibrosis lesions, um, aneurysmal bone cyst, giant cell lesions, eosinophilic granuloma, the metabolic bone disorders, and of course, malignant lesions. So this is a large range of lesions that we need to distinguish from the odontogenic lesions. But as you look at this list, I think what stands out is that the majority of these non-odontogenic lesions either have some vascular or fibrovascular component and or some sort of osseous connective tissue component. And as such, the majority of these non-odontogenic lesions are actually going to appear as mixed cystic or sclerotic lesions. So while we're not going to go through the whole range of lesions, and in fact, we're not going to talk about some of the pediatric lesions, including the myofibroblastic desmoid tumors or metastatic neuroblastoma, I want to just give you a, an overview of some of these lesions and look at how their appearances distinguish them from odontogenic lesions. So what helps us with this, in addition, as we mentioned before, is that the odontogenic lesions, because they arise from odontogenic epithelium, tend to arise within the tooth-bearing areas, which means that they're generally speaking going to be above the mental foramen. Now there is certainly a large overlap. It's a short trip between the roots of these teeth and the mental foramen. So there will be a lot of overlap between these lesions, but when we're starting to look at the center of mass, that can be a helpful feature to distinguish these lesions. So as we said, most of these lesions are not entirely cystic. The exception to this rule would be the solitary bone cyst or traumatic bone cyst, which as you all know is a misnomer. Um, this is in fact a solitary bone cavity. These uh, lesions are only seen in association, in association with trauma in a small minority of patients. We typically do see these in younger patients, more often in the mandible, and you'll see this really well-defined cystic cavity. It does not have any internal septations. There usually is very little to no expansion with this. They typically are T2 hyperintense, but will not have fluid fluid levels, and they sometimes will have a little bit of enhancement. The only other cystic, truly cystic lesion that we'll see um, is an eosinophilic granuloma. Again, we tend to see these more often in the pediatric populations. And what distinguishes these lesions, it is a cystic lesion that you will see within the medullary cavity of the maxilla or the mandible, but it has this classic punched out appearance. Notice that the uh, disruption at the cortex generally is about the same size as the medullary components, that giving you that punched out appearance to that. And that is a way that it's just a subtle feature that will help distinguish this from other lesions. Again, these often have a central soft tissue component and we're looking for extra osseous extension. Now let's talk about some of our vascular lesions and really we're just going to talk about the most common uh, vascular lesions. And of course, this is the aneurysmal bone cyst. Um, and as you all recall, this is a benign vascular proliferation in response to some stimulation. Now, what we see in this patient here um, on our axial bone window CT is this very large sort of multi-cystic appearing mass. But what we can see on the coronal reformats is that this thing is just sort of arising from and just ballooning out from the cortex. So it's not arising from actual teeth or um, tooth bearing areas of the alveolus. It's just sort of pushing out from that cortex. And on post contrast images, we see that it's multi-septated and you get a sense that there are fluid fluid levels in here which is the classic appearance for an aneurysmal bone cyst. Now our differential has to include the central giant cell lesions um, and the brown tumor, as well as the ameloblastoma. So that turn, uh, draws us now to uh, our discussion on giant cell lesions. And one of the giant cell lesions that we do see in the jaws are brown tumors. Um, of course, as we see in association with hyperparathyroidism, and in the jaws, we typically see this most often in association with secondary tertiary hyperparathyroidism. As we see in this patient with this mixed cystic and sclerotic mass, it's expanding the mandible. You see these thicker, coarser septations from this. And I think what you can appreciate on the uh, coronal reformats, again, although you'll see this arising around the tooth-bearing areas of the alveolus, notice that it's eccentric to the mandible here. It's not arising within the center of the alveolus. It's pushing out arising from the uh, lateral aspects of it that gives us a clue that it's perhaps a non-adonogenic lesion. And of course, on post-contrast imaging, this is moderately enhancing. The other lesion that we'll see um, in the jaws is the central giant cell granuloma. And there is still controversy amongst the pathologists as to whether or not this truly represents re a reparative lesion versus an actual neoplasm. But for those that follow the idea that it's a reparative lesion, this is actually distinct from the giant cell lesions, although histopathologically they look pretty much identical. 
Um, these all, of course, are composed of multinucleated giant cells. We do see these more often in the anterior aspect of the maxilla of the mandible, typically in younger females. And what we will see on imaging is an expansile mass here. They often have relatively coarse septations uh, oriented perpendicular to the cortex. And on post-contrast imaging, as we see in this patient, these are moderately enhancing. In another patient with a central giant cell granuloma, again, we see this multicystic mass in the anterior mandible. And you see, again, these relatively coarse septations that are, tend to be oriented perpendicular to the cortex. And even on soft tissue windows with contrast, you see, again, moderately enhancing. Now let's talk about fiber osseous lesions. A number of these do occur in the jaws, uh, and these can be developmental, reactive, or in frank neoplastic lesions. Um, in the most recent version of the WHO, they've subcategorized this into four categories, the cemento-osseous dysplasias um, and the ossifying fibromas. And these are all characterized by abnormal um, fibrous tissue proliferation that starts out more lytic and then ossifies over time. So ultimately what you will see is a central ossified mass with a thin uh, lucent rim around it. One of the more common lesions that you'll encounter in the jaws is something called periapical cemental osseous dysplasia. This is a fiber osseous lesion. Um, the demographics, we tend to find this more often in the anterior mandible and we find these um, in, more commonly in middle-aged uh, individuals, typically African-American females. And what we will see on imaging is a number of these ossified masses at the root apices of the teeth. Now this is the one lesion that we said that sort of violates that principle of nonadongenic lesions being in the tooth bearing regions of the alveolus. You will see these associated with the root apices of the teeth. But what distinguishes this from dental disease is the fact that these teeth are vital. So there's no caries or periodontal disease. And what we'll see is these ossified masses at the root apex that typically have a lucent rim. Now we may see some mild expansion with this, uh, and that's characteristic of these. They typically won't do anything with these lesions unless there is significant expansion. Our differential diagnosis, of course, would include odontoma and ossifying fibroma. The more distributed version of this is the florid osseous dysplasia, where we tend to see these lesions distributed throughout uh, the anterior and posterior quadrants uh, of the maxilla and mandible. And again, as we see in this patient, multiple sclerotic masses at the root apices of the teeth. What you should notice is that there is no caries or periodontal disease on these teeth. So florid osseous dysplasia. Of course, your differential diagnosis should include secondary hyperparathyroidism. The cemento ossifying fibroma now is actually benign neoplasm composed of bone and cementum as well as fibrous tissue as we see in these two different patients. We see this densely sclerotic um, ossified mass with this thin lucent rim expanding the mandible, again, below the tooth bearing areas of the alveolus. In a different patient, we see this more densely mixed uh, sclerotic uh, and a little bit of uh, lucent mass expanding uh, the cortex of the mandible. <clears throat> Another patient with cemento ossifying fibroma, we see this mixed sclerotic and lytic mass expanding anteriorly through the mandible, um, pushing up between the teeth. Again, just a benign appearance of starting to push the teeth apart. But when we hounds field unit of this, we notice that it is a little bit more hyperdense, again, uh, underlying its connective tissue and fibrous composition. There is a subtype, the juvenile ossifying fibroma, Again, benign neoplasm. These are distinguished because they tend to be a little bit more aggressive and, and as their name suggests, occur in younger patient populations as we see in these uh, images, these vintage images, as I should say, as those of you of my generation will recognize from the marks that these are actually taken from film. And we see this partially sclerotic mass expanding the mandible. Notice the central ossification within this. In another patient uh, with more recent images, um, of a patient with juvenile ossifying fibroma. This is a somatoid uh, version of this. And we see again these densely ossified masses expanding the posterior ethmoid and plain and sphenoidal in this patient. We see the extension uh, within the orbit in this patient. And on MR imaging, the classic appearance of ossifying fibroma is this mixed uh, T1 hyperintense, mildly enhancing, and of course, um, significantly T2 hypointense mass. Fibrous dysplasia, as we all know, occurs uh, with both monostotic and polyostotic forms, as we see in this patient uh, with monostotic fibrous dysplasia. Now here we see this mixed lytic and sclerotic masses expanding the mandible. Notice the preservation of the cortex uh, in this patient. And we also notice when we look soft tissue window is that there is certainly some edema in the adjacent medial pterygoid and masseter muscle. And because of this, 
we need to include in our differential, osteomy differential diagnosis osteomyelitis, which could be of the acute or chronic variety. And in particular, we need to think about the chronic recurrent multifocal osteomyelitis or SAFO or GARES uh, proliferative periostitis. Now, to just distinguish this, this is a patient with osteomyelitis, and you'll notice, again, a very similar appearing diffuse um, sclerosis in the mandible with multiple cystic areas. Here now we've got this irregular periosteal reaction, which um, gives rise to the notion that this is an inflammatory lesion. And again, we see the edema in the medial pterygoid um, and masseter muscles. So again, important to distinguish osteomyelitis from fibrous dysplasia. Polyostotic fibrous dysplasia, as we see in these two different patients, uh, presents these multiple mixed lytic and sclerotic gross expansion of the maxilla and mandibles we see in this patient. Um, both of these patients have McCune Albright syndrome, and in this patient, very late um, lesions that are densely uh, sclerotic. Cherubism, um, this is my one pediatric case here, um, arises as a, a different gene mutation um, from fibrous dysplasia, which, as we all know, is on chromosome 20. This is, arises from a mutation at signal transduction uh, mechanisms on chromosome 4. Uh, and what we tend to see are these mixed cystic and sclerotic lesions in the posterior quadrants of both the maxilla and the mandibles. So you see this uh, multi-cystic lytic lesions arising with these um, thickened internal trabeculations. We see this in young patients typically um, between the ages of, of 1 and, and 6 or 8. Uh, these do spontaneously regress over time. And it's this uh, particular involvement of just the posterior quadrants that gives these patients their cherub appearance. So this is cherubism. Now let's turn our attention now to malignant disease. Um, we do see intraosseous uh, lymphoma in the maxilla and mandible. It is actually quite rare, but amongst the malignant uh, non-adonogenic lesions, it's one of the more common lesions that we'll see um, in this patient. Now what we can see here is uh, multiple soft tissue masses arising from the mandible, extending actually through the mental foramen into the extraosseous soft tissues. We see an additional soft tissue mass anteriorly. And when we look at the bone windows, what we see is that there really is this gross disruption of the medullary components. So the marrow spaces have been expanded. There's sort of this irregular response to it, which should give us the notion that this is a hematopoietic uh, response going on. And indeed, this is lymphoma. On uh, PET-CT, we see that both the intraosseous lesions as well as the extraosseous lesions are FDG avid. In contrast, in this patient with a history of multiple myeloma, we see this lytic mass in the parasymphyseal mandible. We see it's blowing through the cortex. Now, what I want you to notice here is similar to what we've seen with the eosinophilic granuloma in this patient with plasma cytoma, we see that the extent of the lesion, the way it just punches out the cortex is a little bit more consistent with these myelobitous uh, lesions. There is some soft tissue extension here of this mass, but notice that on contrast imaging, this is really not enhancing at all and is really only mildly FDG avid in contrast to lymphoma. We do see metastatic lesions within the mandible and maxilla. Typically, these are from the lung in this patient with metastatic adenocarcinoma. We see this lytic mass. Notice the gross erratic, irregular lytic erosion. It's not expanding in that much, but it's just eroding through it. And we see this enhancing soft tissue mass into the adjacent gingival buccal soft tissues. And this is, of course, the patient's primary in the lung. Now, this was a young patient, um, at least in my idea, young. Uh, patient presenting with jaw pain and headache, and we see this re just really irregular, gross sort of dog bite erosion of the entire ramus of the mandible on post-contrast imaging. We see that it's this kind of mildly enhancing mass, but there certainly is extension uh, within the medial pterygoid and masseter muscles. On MR imaging, we see that's this gross, uh, diffuse uh, marrow replacement of the mandible, and on T2-weighted imaging, extension into the adjacent muscles. And certainly when we do diffusion imaging, we see there is diffusion restriction, uh, which tells us that this is malignant lesion, and indeed this is a central mucoepidermoid carcinoma. Ewing sarcoma we will see in the maxilla and mandible, typically in younger patients, although we will see it in adults. This was a 30-year-old um, female presenting with jaw pain and paresthesia. Now, in this case, we see this, again, diffuse marrow replacement on our T1-weighted images, heterogeneous T2 hyperintense, and enhancing medullary replacement um, in this patient. Now, what should come to mind, of course, is osteomyelitis, but when we look, there's really no surrounding inflammatory response whatsoever. We also see extension through the mental foramen, which should lead us to believe that this is a uh, malignant lesion in this patient with Ewing sarcoma.
Osteosarcomas uh, typically do present with expansile masses. This is a patient with chondroblastic osteosarcoma in which we see this really dense sclerotic lesion in the maxillary alveolus and our coronal and axial T2 weighted images. We see this really T2 hyperintense mass underlying its chondroid components and of course heterogeneously enhancing infiltrative mass in this patient with osteosarcoma. And as we mentioned, these chondroblastic uh, osteosarcomas can really present with this very dense ossified mass as we see in this patient uh, again with chondroblastic osteosarcoma. And that of course needs to be distinguished from chondrosarcoma as we see in this patient with this cystic mass arising uh, from the mandible. But again, it's eccentrically extending out from the alveolus and as we see the cortex is actually intact here, leading us uh, to suggest that this is a non-adonogenic lesion. We see the classic eggshell peripheral uh, calcification in this patient with chondrosarcoma. So that wraps up our discussion of adonogenic and not adonogenic lesions, and I thank you for your attention. Our next speaker is Dr. Kayvon Schiefte from Montefiore Medical Center and Albert Einstein College of Medicine, who will be speaking about sinus anatomy and anatomical variants. Hello, everyone. I hope you are enjoying the conference. For the next 25 minutes, I'm going to go over sinus anatomy and its anatomical variants. First, I would like to thank Dr. Shemalfis for inviting me to speak today. I have no disclosure. Our objectives today is to review relevant anatomy of the nasal cavities and paranasal sinuses. Then we are going to discuss drainage pathways. And lastly, we are going to review anatomical variants. The nasal cavities are located on either side of nasal septum. Paranasal sinuses are located laterally and also superiorly to the nasal cavity. As you can see, the orbits are also located laterally and superiorly in relationship to the paranasal sinus. The anterior kernel fossa is located above and also posterior to the paranasal sinuses. Oral cavity is located underneath the nasal cavity. And lastly, the central skull base is behind the nasal paranasal sinuses. And behind the nasal cavity is the nasopharynx. Now, the nasal septum is located between the nasal bones. The nasal septum is composed of three segments, one cartilaginous and two bony segments. The cartilaginous segment is the anteroinferior portion of the nasal septum. There are two bony segments. One is the vomer, which is the posteroinferior portion of the nasal septum. And the second one is the perpendicular plate of ethmoid, which is the posterior superior segment of the nasal septum, as you can see here. So this is the perpendicular plate of the ethmoid, and below it is the vomer. Now, the most anterior part of the nasal cavity is nasal vestibule. Preform aperture forms the boundary between the nasal vestibule and the nasal cavity. Therefore, a preform aperture width less than 11 millimeter in a term infant is considered diagnostic of preform aperture stenosis. Nasal coina forms the boundary between the nasal cavity and nasopharynx. Width of coenal airspace less than 3 millimeter, and in this case, is diagnostic of coenal stenosis in newborn. Coenal atresia refers to lack of formation of coenal opening, which can be unilateral or bilateral. Now, cribriform plate forms the roof of the nasal cavity. It is located lateral to the cristogalli. Cribriform plate is divided by vertical attachment of the middle turbinate into medial and lateral lamella of cribriform plate. Medial lamella of cribriform plate separates the olfactory fossa above 
from the olfactory recess, which is located below. So olfactory recess is located between the nasal septum and vertical lamella of middle turbinate. Opacification of the olfactory recess is uncommon in the absence of ethmoidal mucosal disease, prior ethmoidectomy, or turbinectomy. So when you see opacification in its location, MRI may be warranted to exclude meningocele, cephalocele, or even neoplasm. Now, the lateral lamella of the cribriform plate is the thinnest and most vulnerable bony portion of the knee skull base in terms of intraoperative injury, which is confounded by the attachment of the middle turbinate. As the depth of the olfactory fossa increases, the lateral lamella becomes more vulnerable to intraoperative injury either directly or through manipulation during turbinectomy or ethmoidectomy. Therefore, it is very important to document the maximum depth of the olfactory fossa and resultant length of lateral lamella. So for this reason, we use the Keros classification. So if the depth of the olfactory fossa is less than four millimeter, it's called it's type one. If the depth of the olfactory fossa is between four and seven millimeter, it's type two. And if it's more than seven millimeter, it is type three. So remember, as the depth of the olfactory fossa increases, the risk of skull base injury during surgery also increases. Now within the nasal cavity, one may see the superior middle and inferior turbinate and lateral and inferior to the turbinates are the superior middle and inferior meatus. Occasionally, supreme turbinate can also be found above the superior turbinate. The inferior turbinate is the largest of the three turbinates. The inferior meatus surrounds the inferior turbinate and it receives drainage from nasolacrimal duct. Now, middle turbinate has three attachments. The first attachment I'm going to show is the vertical strut of middle turbinate, which attaches superiorly to the junction of medial and lateral lamella of cribriform plate. Now, the second attachment is laterally, which where the middle turbinate via the basal lamella attaches to the thin lamina papricia. And lastly, the third attachment is the posteriorly, which attaches to the medial maxillary sinus wall. So these are the three attachments of the middle turbinate. So now we're going to go over the basal lamella. So basal lamella divides the ethmoid air cells into anterior and posterior compartments. So this is the basal lamella, anterior and posterior compartment, anterior ethmoid and posterior ethmoid. Now the middle meatus surrounds the middle turbinate and drains secretion from the frontal sinus, anterior ethmoid air cells, and maxillary sinus. So frontal, anterior ethmoid, and maxillary, they all drain into the middle meatus, and nasolacrimal duct drains into the middle uh, inferior meatus. The superior turbinate is the smallest of the three turbinates. The superior meatus drains secretion from the posterior ethmoid air cells and also sphenoid sinus. So we have sphenoid sinus and posterior ethmoid draining to the superior meatus. Nasolacrimal duct drains into the inferior meatus. And then the frontal, anterior ethmoid, and the maxillary, they drain into the middle meatus. The ethmoid sinuses lie between the upper part of the nasal cavity and orbits. The lateral wall of the ethmoid sinus is this thin bone, which is called lamina papricia. When lamina papricia is displaced medially, in the, as in this case, into the ethmoid sinus, it can be mistaken for an ethmoid sinus septation during ethmoidectomy. 
and that would place the orbital structures at risk for intraorbital penetration and intraorbital hematoma. So therefore, it's very important to note this finding and mention in your report before a patient goes to the surgery. The inferior surface of ethmoid sinus is related to the roof of maxillary antrum. The medial wall of each ethmoid sinus is formed by the vertical strut of superior and inferior turbinate. Again, the medial wall of the ethmoid sinus is made by the superior and middle vertical strut of the turbinates. The roof of the ethmoid sinus is formed by the orbital process of the frontal bone known as fovea ethmoidalis. Remember, fovea ethmoidalis is different than cribriform plate, which forms the roof of the nasal cavity. So fovea ethmoidalis forms the roof of ethmoid sinus, and cribriform plate forms the roof of nasal cavity. Now, the anterior ethmoidal artery is a branch of ophthalmic artery that supplies portions of the paranasal sinuses and nasal cavity. As the artery enters the ethmoid sinus, it forms a notch within the lamina papricia. Now, if the notch abuts the fovea ethmoidalis, as in this case, then the artery is considered relatively protected during surgery. However, if there is pneumatization above the anterior ethmoidal notch, then the artery is at increased risk of injury during surgery since the artery travels freely within the ethmoid sinus. The maxillary sinuses are located on either side of the nasal cavity. Its roof is formed by the floor of the orbit, which also contains the infraorbital canal, which carries second branch of trigeminal nerve. Floor is formed by the maxillary alveolar process. Its medial wall is formed by the lateral wall of the nasal cavity. And lastly, its osteum is located at the superior medial wall, as you can see here. Now, the sphenoid sinuses are housed in the body of sphenoid bone. They are located posterior to the ethmoid sinus and nasal cavity. Inferior to sphenoid sinus are the pterygoid bones, as you can see here. Sphenoid sinus is located anteroinferior to the cella. Its roof is the planum sphenoidale, which you can see on coronal and sagittal view. Its dorsal wall is the tuberculum cella. You also have the floor of the cella here. And behind the sphenoid sinus, you have the clivus. Remember, below the sphenoid sinus is nasal pharynx. Now, a sphenoid sinus septum divides it into two parts. A sphenoid sinus is surrounded by very important structures which are the carotid arteries, as you can see here, vidian canals, which are located just above the medial plate. Next one is the foramen rotundum, which are located superlateral to the vidian canal. And next is the optic canal, which are medial to anterior clinoid. Now, awareness of the intimate relationship between the internal carotid artery and the sphenoid sinus is very crucial because the intersphenoid sinus septum is often deflected to one side and may attach to the bony wall covering the internal carotid artery, just like in this case. Now, internal carotid artery can be injured when the septum is evolved during surgery. Therefore, any attachment of the major or even accessory sphenoid septum to the bony wall covering the carotid artery should be noted and reported in dictation. So if the surgeon decides to remove this sphenoid septum, he should be aware that they are attached to the carotid canal and that would may injure the carotid arteries. Now, bony dehiscence along the margins of the carotid canal, just like here or here, 
should be also noted and reported since it will render internal carotid artery susceptible to injury during surgery. The degree of sphenoid sinus pneumatization varies considerably. As you can see here, the left sphenoid sinus is small, the right one is dominant. And therefore, the sphenoid sinus pneumatization with respect to clivus and cella can be divided into three types. The first one is called the control, which is basically under pneumatization of the sphenoid sinus, as in this case. Second one is called the pericellar type, where the pneumatization extends posteriorly to the anterior margin of the cella. And the third type is the cellar type, which is basically you have hyper pneumatization causing thin posterior bony margin of the clivus. Now remember, the cella variant is important to identify preoperatively since it places the thin posterior clival margin at risk for inadvertent perforation. Remember, behind the clivus is the basilar artery. Now, anterior clinal pneumatization, also something is very important to note and make sure to report it in your dictation because that would put the optic nerve at risk and therefore should be reported. Because if they put their instrument in the anterior clinode, they can easily injure the optic nerve. The frontal sinuses are located anterior to anterior cranial fossa, as you can see on axial and central view. There is usually a central septum dividing the frontal sinuses into two parts. However, accessory septation may also be seen within the frontal sinuses. Now let's go over the drainage pathways. Knowledge of drainage pathway is key to understanding functional anatomy and pattern of disease. Each paranasal sinuses has a specific drainage pathway for the clearance of its secretion. So let's start with frontal sinus. The drainage pathway for the frontal sinuses is the frontal sinus outflow tract, which usually drains into the middle meatus. It is found lateral to the vertical lamella of middle turbinate. Next one is the maxillary sinus drainage pathway, which is the osteomedial units, which refers to the common drainage pathway of the frontal, maxillary, and anterior ethmoid sinus. This unit has six components. One is the maxillary sinus osteum. Next one is the infundibulum. Third is the hiatus semilunaris. Four is the uncinate process. Fifth is middle turbinate. And lastly is the middle meatus. So every time you're looking at the osteomial unit, you want to make a comment and evaluate these six regions. The osteum, infundibulum, hiatus semilunaris, uncinate process, middle turbinate, and middle meatus. Now, the drainage pathway for the sphenoid sinuses is the sphenoethmoidal recess, as you can see here. These are located lateral to the nasal septum. Here's the nasal septum, and just lateral to it is the sphenoethmoidal recess. The osteum of the ethmoid sinus is located at the anterosuperior portion of the sinus. The basal lamella, as we discussed before, is an anatomic landmark for separating the anterior from posterior ethmoidal air cells. So ethmoidal air cells located anterior to the basal lamella will drain via the frontal sinus outflow tract into the middle meatus. And the posterior ethmoidal air cells will drain via the sphenoethmoidal recess into the superior meatus. Now let's move to anatomic variants. Why are they important? Because they may predispose individual to inflammatory sinonasal disease or symptoms of nasal obstruction. They may also affect surgical technique or increase risk of complication during surgery. So it is extremely important to mention all these anatomic variants when you see one 
in your report, especially before patient going for surgery. Now, the first anatomic variant we're going to discuss is onodes cells. Onodes cells are defined as a posterior ethmoidal cells that extends posteriorly over the sphenoid sinus. So on coronal view, when you see a horizontal septation within the sphenoid sinus, that is a clue that above it is the onodes cell and below is the sphenoid sinus. Of course, this needs to be confirmed on satchel view. Here is another case. We have a coronal view and we have a horizontal septation. So above it is the onodes cell and below the sphenoid sinus. Now the optic nerve commonly courses through the onodes cell with a thin margin of bone separating the optic nerve from the underlying air cell. Onodes cell places the optic nerve at risk when surgical excision of the cells is performed, especially when surgeons are unaware that they are in an onodes cell. So it's very important to mention when you see one. Now, the Haller cells are ethmoid air cells located underneath the orbital floor and below the ethmoid pulla. They extend lateral to the plane of lamina papricia. Haller cells may narrow the maxillary sinus osteum or infundibulum, of course, result in inflammatory disease. Next variant is pneumatized middle turbinate or contrabullosa, which may narrow the middle meatus and cause lateral deviation of the uncinate process and therefore narrowing the ethmoid infundibulum and cause narrowing of the osteomedial unit. Now, normally the convexity of the middle turbinate bones is directed medially toward the nasal septum. However, when it is paradoxically curved, the convexity of the bone is directed laterally. Therefore, the edge of the middle terminate may result in narrowing of the middle meatus, lateral deviation of the uncinate process, and therefore can narrow the ethmoid infundibulum. Of course, nasal septal deviation, especially with the bony spur, may cause lateral displacement of the middle terminate with narrowing of the middle meatus. Now, there are multiple variation can be seen with uncinate process attachment, and these should be reported in your dictation. The uncinate process may attach to the lamina papricia, as in this case, or it may attach to the anterior skull base, or it may attach to the vertical strut of middle turbinate, as seen here. So these are the variations that needs to be mentioned in your dictation. Because when there is, let's say, lateral deviation of the onset process or even pneumatization of the onset process, it can narrow the ethmoid infundibulum. Now, lamina papricia may be at risk during onsenectomy in the setting of under pneumatized or atelectatic maxillary sinus due to a position of the onset process with the lamina papricia. So therefore, whenever you see maxillary sinus under pneumatized and you see the onset process is sitting next to the lamina papricia, that's very important finding to mention because during the surgery, if the patient is undergoing onsenectomy, they can really easily injure the lamina papricia. Now, what are the anatomic variants that can affect frontal ethmoidal recess? Agonese cells, type 1, type 2, type 3, type 4 air frontal cells. You can also have supraorbital ethmoid air cells. And lastly, you can have interfrontal sinus septal cells. So let's go over these individually because they can narrow the frontal ethmoid recess. So what is agonese cells? These are the most anterior of all ethmoid cells. They are located anterior to the attachment of the middle turbinate to the skull base. The lateral wall of, is formed by lamina papricia. Here is an example of agonese cells narrowing the frontotomodal recess. Type 1 frontal cell is a single anterior ethmoid cell sitting above agonese cell. 
it should not extend into the frontal sinus and it may narrow the frontal recess. Type 2 frontal cells are defined as two anterior ethmoidal cells sitting above the agonese cell and they may narrow the frontal recess. Type 3 frontal cells is a single large cell sitting above the agonese cell that extend into the frontal sinus. It may also narrow the frontal recess. Type 4 frontal cell is an ethmoidal air cell that is totally isolated within the frontal sinus and does not abut the agonese cell and also may narrow the frontal recess. Supraorbital ethmoid air cells are located posterolateral to the frontal sinus, superior to the orbit, and lateral to the lamina papricia. Now, another anatomic variant affecting frontal ethmoid recess is called frontal bullar cell. The frontal bullar cell is located above the ethmoid bulla and above the frontal osteum. It must extend into the frontal sinus. You can see here agonese cell, and you can see the frontal ethmoid recess is narrowed by these two cells. Another anatomic variant affecting frontal sinus outflow tract is called suprabullar cell. These cells also located above the ethmoid bulla, but it is located below the frontal osteum and they do not extend into the frontal sinus. Here is another agonese cells and you can see the frontal ethmoid recess is narrowed by these two cells. Interfrontal sinus septal cell is defined by pneumatization within the midline or paramedian bony septum between the frontal sinuses. An example, you can see is an opacified interfrontal sinus septal cell narrowing the frontal recess. And lastly, when there is a position of the ethmoid labyrinth to the vertical strut of the middle turbinate, this can narrow the frontal sinus outflow tract. You can see on the right side, the ethmoid labyrinth is not opposed to the vertical strut of the middle turbinate and the frontal sinus outflow tract is patent. And for that, thank you for your time and enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you. Our next speaker is Dr. William O'Brien from University of Cincinnati, who will be speaking about acute versus chronic sinusitis. Good afternoon, everyone. I'd like to thank you for tuning in for this session where we're going to be talking about acute versus chronic sinusitis along with complications of inflammatory paranasal sinus disease. In terms of the outline, we'll start out looking at the different types of inflammatory sinus disease. We'll then go over common patterns of obstructive paranasal sinus disease. We'll talk about some entities that I like to refer to as complicated sinus disease. And then we'll wrap things up with an illustrative review of some of the common and important orbital and intracranial complications of paranasal sinus disease. So when we're talking about acute versus chronic sinusitis, one thing that we have to keep in mind as imagers is that these are clinical diagnoses. So in looking at acute sinusitis, this is defined as patients with symptoms less than four weeks in duration, and they typically present with nasal congestion and oftentimes headaches. Vast majority of cases are going to be viral in etiology with a smaller percentage being bacterial, and acute sinusitis is treated medically. Now, in cases of uncomplicated acute sinusitis, imaging is not necessary. Imaging is really reserved for patients that have recurrent sinusitis, medically refractory sinusitis, or chronic cases that need to undergo further evaluation. Now, patients are imaged in the acute setting. Air fluid levels and frothy or bubbly attenuation or stranding are the imaging findings that can support the clinical diagnosis of acute sinusitis, but in and of themselves, those findings are nonspecific. So here's an illustrative case of a patient that presented with a clinical diagnosis of acute sinusitis. And on this axial CT, you can see bilateral maxillary sinus air fluid levels with superimposed frothy stranding that would support the clinical diagnosis of acute sinusitis.
Now, the same goes for chronic sinusitis. That diagnosis cannot be made by imaging alone. It requires clinical correlation. About one-fourth to one-half of asymptomatic patients that undergo imaging have findings that we would associate with inflammatory sinus disease on CT or MRI, but since they are asymptomatic, by definition, they do not have chronic sinusitis. So how do you diagnose chronic sinusitis? First of all, patients have to have symptoms for greater than or equal to 12 weeks in duration with two or more of the following cardinal signs or symptoms on clinical presentation. Nasal obstruction, facial pain or pressure, purulent nasal discharge, and decreased olfaction, plus one or more of the following, and this is where imaging can play a role. Inflammation on imaging, we're in the setting of chronic sinusitis, it's mucosal thickening greater than three millimeters in thickness, mucus retention cyst, and osteitis. You can also see nasal polyps, both on imaging as well as clinical inspection, and then clinically they can see purulence in the region of the middle meatus. So here's an example of a patient referred with the clinical history of chronic sinusitis, and here we could see moderate left and mild right maxillary sinus mucosal thickening with a small nasal polyp within the posterior right nasal cavity or coina. Another patient, similar clinical history. And here on the left, we could see a mucus retention cyst along the floor of the left maxillary sinus and some mild mucosal thickening on the right. Now, osteitis is the one time where we could be fairly confident on imaging that there are objective signs of chronic inflammation. Because when bone is chronically inflamed, it does what it likes to do, and that's form new bone. So in the setting of osteitis, what you're going to see is abnormal bony thickening and sclerosis along the walls of a completely or partially opacified paranasal sinus. So in this illustrative case, here you can see near complete opacification of the left sphenoid sinus with abnormal bony sclerosis and thickening of its lateral wall compatible with osteitis. Now in the next talk, we're going to learn all about invasive fungal sinusitis. So in this talk, I want to just briefly touch on allergic fungal sinusitis. So allergic fungal sinusitis is where you have chronic and recurrent colonization with non-invasive fungi. It tends to affect immunocompetent patients as opposed to invasive fungal sinusitis, which is much more common in immunosuppressed patients. So with allergic fungal sinusitis, it's more common in humid climates, and you'll see have an increased incidence in patients with asthma, multiple allergies, and sinonasal polyposis. So on imaging, what we're going to see is opacified and expanded paranasal sinuses with central increased attenuation. And as you get more significant expansion of the paranasal sinuses, you can have an associated facial or orbital deformity. On MRI, fungal secretions are often hypo-intense, and occasionally they can be so hypo-intense that they can actually mimic an aerated sinus. The reason for that hypo-intensity on MRI is a combination of inspissated or proteinaceous secretions, fungal elements, and heavy metals associated with that fungal colonization. Now, if you give contrast, you're going to see peripheral mucosal enhancement, and that helps differentiate this from a central solid-enhancing mass. And even though this is non-invasive, you can have intracranial and orbital extension as you get that bony expansion. So here's an example case. This is an adolescent with allergic fungal sinusitis. Both CT and MRI were performed on the same day. On CT, here you can see significant paranasal sinus opacification with areas of central increased attenuation. Paranasal sinus expansion resulting in hypertelarism. Then if you go down to MR, all those areas of increased attenuation are hypo-intense on MR to the degree that they actually mimic an aerated sinus. And again, that's due to a combination of inspissated proteinaceous secretions, fungal elements, and heavy metals, very characteristic of allergic fungal sinusitis. So now we're going to look at the different patterns of obstructive inflammatory sinus disease. But before we do that, I just want to briefly review the dominant drainage pathways of the paranasal sinuses. So the osteomedal complex, that's the primary drainage pathway for the maxillary anterior ethmoid and frontal sinuses. And it consists of the maxillary antrum, infundibulum, hiatus semilunaris, and it drains into the middle meatus. And it's bordered by the uncinate process, the middle turbinate, and then the medial and inferior orbital walls.
The frontal recess is best evaluated on the off midline sagittal view. And the landmarks that you're looking for is the auger nausea cell or other frontal cells. And that's going to be the anterior border of the frontal recess, as well as anterior to the ethmoid bulla. And the frontal recess is the primary drainage pathway for the frontal sinus. And it either drains into the middle meatus or the infundibulum, depending upon the attachment site of the uncinate process. And then this sphenoethmoidal recess can be identified on various planes. On axial imaging, you can see it along the anteromedial aspect of the sphenoid sinus. That's going to be the tri primary drainage pathway for the posterior ethmoid and the sphenoid sinuses, and that's going to drain towards the superior meatus. So now we'll start looking at the different patterns of obstructive paranasal sinus disease. So if you have obstruction of the paranasal sinus outlet pathways, then you can actually get upstream or proximal obstruction of the draining paranasal sinuses. So the first pattern we'll talk about is the infundibular pattern, and that is when we have opacification extending from the maxillary antrum into the infundibulum, and that can result in isolated maxillary sinus opacification like we can see in this illustrative case here. Here we can see the opacification going through the antrum into the proximal to mid infundibulum with associated complete opacification of that right maxillary sinus and a little bit of osteitis associated with chronic inflammation. Next is the osteomedial complex or the middle meatus pattern. So if we get opacification of the osteomedial complex that extends into and involves the middle meatus, then we can get upstream opacification like you can see in this case here, where we have complete maxillary, anterior ethmoid, and frontal sinus opacification associated with this osteomedial complex pattern. So the next pattern that we'll talk about is the frontal recess pattern, and this refers to obstruction of the frontal ostium extending into the frontal recess. You can have isolated frontal sinus opacification, like we could see in this illustrative case here, where you have complete opacification of the right frontal sinus, or you could have varying involvement of the anterior ethmoid sinus as well. The maxillary sinus is going to be spared when we're talking about isolated frontal recess pattern of obstruction. So the last pattern that we'll talk about is the sphenoethmoidal recess pattern. And with the sphenoethmoidal recess obstruction, you can get varying degrees of sphenoid and or posterior ethmoid sinus opacification. It just depends on where that obstruction is relative to the ostea that are going to drain those paranasal sinuses. So in this illustrative case here, you can see subtotal opacification of the left sphenoid sinus extending into the sphenoethmoidal recess. In this case, the posterior ethmoid sinus is spared. And then we could also see those chronic signs of inflammation with associated osteitis. So now we'll talk about some entities that I like to refer to as complicated inflammatory sinus disease. So the first one is the sinus coenal polyp. So this is where you have opacification of a paranasal sinus that extends through and expands an ostium and then herniates into the nasal cavity. And since you have involvement of the nasal cavity, patients often present with ipsilateral nasal obstruction. So what you're going to see on imaging is an opacified sinus, a polypoid lesion within the nasal cavity, and then a stalk of varying degrees of thickness that communicates that opacified sinus and that polypoid lesion within the posterior nasal cavity. So by far the most common involves the maxillary sinus and that's the anterocoanal polyp and then a sphenocoanal polyp is much less common. Since this is a chronic process you can have central inspissator proteinaceous secretions. If you do give contrast you're going to see peripheral enhancement because again that's going to help separate this from an underlying solid enhancing sinonasal mass. So here's a characteristic example of an anterocoanal polyp, complete opacification of the left maxillary sinus extending through and expanding the antrum with a polypoid component going into the posterior nasal cavity. The next entity is a mucosal. So these are slow-growing cystic lesions that are caused by chronic sinus outlet obstruction. Most often they involve one or they can involve two adjacent paranasal sinuses. So on an imaging, what you're going to see is opacification and expansion of the involved paranasal sinus or paranasal sinuses. Since it's a chronic process, you can have internal proteinaceous content, and occasionally you can get superinfection where you get surrounding inflammatory changes, and that's referred to as a mucopiocele. 
even though this is as a benign process, as you get that sinus expansion, oftentimes you're gonna see areas of bony demineralization and you can see frank dehiscence, which allows for extension into intraorbital and intracranial compartments. So here's an illustrative case, patient with complete opacification of the frontal sinus, here you can see expansion of the sinus on the left with an area of frank bony dehiscence. On MR, you can see that there's some flattening of the underlying left frontal lobe. And then you could see the cystic mucosal with some small areas of protonaceous content that are T1 hyperintense and T2 hypointense characteristic of a mucosal. So here's an example of a case where you have involvement of two adjacent paranasal sinuses. So here we can see complete opacification and expansion of the right ethmoid sinus. There's extension into the right orbit, an area of bony dehiscence involving the lamina papricia and associated radiologic proptosis. On the coronal, we can again see the ethmoid involvement, but now you can see extension into opacification of and mild expansion of that maxillary sinus as well. So the next entity I want to talk about is silent sinus syndrome. And this refers to atelectasis of an opacified maxillary sinus. And this is thought to be caused by chronic obstruction of the maxillary antrum, which results in negative pressure within the sinus cavity. You end up getting inward collapse of the walls of the maxillary sinus. Most often, you're going to see inferior displacement of the orbital floor, but then you can also see lateral deviation of the medial maxillary sinus wall along with the uncinate. Like most chronic processes, you can see inspissated or protonaceous secretions, and oftentimes this can be difficult to distinguish on imaging from an opacified hypoplastic maxillary sinus, which is much more common. So what you want to look for is the degree of pneumatization along the floor of the sinus, and then also patients with silent sinus syndrome may present with acute or chronic onset of a facial or orbital deformity. So here's an illustrative case where we have complete opacification of the right maxillary sinus extending into the infundibulum. Right maxillary sinus is smaller than the left, but you have normal pneumatization along the floor of the sinus that's comparable to the contralateral side. Here you can see inferior displacement and abnormal rounded contour of the orbital floor compared to the normal location and gentle lateral downsloping of the orbital floor on the left. The last entity I'd like to talk about in this portion of the lecture is odontogenic sinusitis, and this refers to maxillary sinusitis that results either from local spread of periodontal disease or secondary to dental intervention. In most of the literature, this represents about 10% of cases of refractory maxillary sinusitis. And this infection is refractory to medical therapy because it's typically a mixed anaerobic and aerobic infection with the anaerobic component coming from the periodontal disease. So your first time medical therapy is not going to have adequate anaerobic coverage to treat the underlying odontogenic origin. So the main treatment includes broad spectrum antibiotics, and then you have to deal with the underlying periodontal disease. And oftentimes that may result in a tooth extraction or repair of a oral antrofistula if it's present, but really these patients need to see a dentist or an oral maxillofacial surgeon prior to seeing an ENT surgeon. They still may need functional endoscopic sinus surgery, but you have to treat that periodontal disease first or you'll never get clinical resolution. So here's an illustrative case where you can see complete opacification of the maxillary sinus extending throughout the osteomedal complex into the nasal cavity. You have areas of bony demineralization involving the uncinate process as well as the middle terminate. Secondary signs of chronic inflammation with osteitis along its lateral wall. And then when you look at the maxillary molars on the right, prominent periapical lucency with an area of frank bony dehiscence. When we look on the sagittal reformatted image, again, complete opacification. Here are those periapical molar lucencies with an area of frank bony dehiscence. So now we'll finish up talking about some of the common and important orbital and intracranial complications of paranasal sinus disease. So the first complication I'd like to talk about is postseptal orbital cellulitis, which by far is the most common orbital complication of paranasal sinus disease. It typically results from underlying ethmoid sinus inflammatory disease. Less often, it's associated with frontal sinusitis. The initial inflammation can progress to a subperiosteal orbital abscess, 
And on CT, what we're looking for in the setting of an orbital abscess is a hypodense collection along the lamina papricia. When we're talking about the ethmoid sinus, which is most common, it'll be along the superior orbital rim if it's associated with the frontal sinus. You'll see surrounding inflammatory changes involving both the orbital fat and extraocular muscles. And as you have a space occupying lesion and inflammation, you can have associated orbital proptosis. Complications include visual loss, venous thrombosis, and intracranial spread of the orbital infection. So here's an illustrative case in an adolescent that presented with new onset visual impairment after failed sinus therapy. Here we can see marked sphenoid and left ethmoid paranasal sinus opacification. There's some demineralization along the lamina papricia. Here is that subperiosteal abscess with surrounding inflammatory fat stranding involving the extraconal medial orbit. And then we have abnormal thickening and medial deviation of the medial rectus muscle with associated proptosis. Now, once you have inflammation within the orbit, patients are susceptible to ophthalmic vein thrombosis. Most often involves the superior ophthalmic vein, but you can have less often involvement of the inferior ophthalmic veins as well. Now, once they do have ophthalmic vein thrombosis, you tend to have an escalation of clinical symptoms with worsening visual disturbances, and then you can have painful proptosis. So on imaging, what you're going to see is enlargement and absence of enhancement or flow-related signal intensity within the involved ophthalmic vein. So here's an illustrative case of superior ophthalmic vein thrombosis. So first we'll look at the normal side. On the left, we have normal size and enhancement of the supraophthalmic vein. On the right, you have abnormal enlargement and absent enhancement. Go on to MR, similar findings, enhancement on the left, abnormal enlargement with absence of enhancement on the right. And then here you can see the significant orbital inflammatory changes in the setting of significant inflammatory sinus disease. Now here's an example of inferior ophthalmic vein thrombosis. So here's a normal enhancing inferior ophthalmic vein on the left. Here you can see abnormal enlargement and absent enhancement on the right. There's a little bit of associated proptosis, and here you can see some subtle inflammation of the intraconal fat in the setting of significant ethmoid sinus opacification. Now, once you have ophthalmic vein thrombosis, you need to make sure that both your imaging and your search pattern go all the way through the cavernous sinus to evaluate for cavernous sinus thrombosis, which is a rare but very serious complication of paranasal sinus disease with associated orbital inflammation. Cavernous sinus can be involved because that's going to be your drainage pathway for the ophthalmic veins. Now, once you have cavernous sinus thrombosis, what you're going to see on imaging is abnormal expansion and patchy areas of non-enhancement. And then on MRI, you'll also see uh, abnormal signal intensity associated with the involved cavernous sinus. You want to make sure that you look at those cavernous carotid arteries for an inflammatory involvement. Typically, it's going to be vasospasm, but very important to look at your arterial vasculature within the cavernous sinus. Once you have cavernous sinus thrombosis, oftentimes you get an escalation in clinical symptoms. So patients have progressive orbital and facial edema, and then treatment is antibiotics along with anticoagulation. So here's that same patient that we just saw on CT, in this case MR, Marked paranasal sinus opacification, significant right and less pronounced left orbital inflammatory changes, abnormal dural enhancement extending along the margins of an expanded cavernous sinus with patchy areas of dawn enhancement. Very characteristic, but very important to look for that cavernous sinus thrombosis. So now we'll briefly touch base on uh, intracranial spread. And this most often results from frontal sinus disease. You could also see it associated with sphenoid sinusitis as well. And the imaging appearance really depends on what type of process you have. So epidural abscesses, you're going to see epidural collection with restricted diffusion. Subdural empyemas is going to be a subdural collection with restricted diffusion. Meningitis, you'll see leptomeningeal and or pachymeningeal enhancement. Cerebritis, you'll see focal cortical and subcortical edema, and you could have varying degrees of enhancement and restricted diffusion. And then parenchymal abscesses will be rim enhancing with central restricted diffusion and pronounced surrounding edema. Patients typically present with severe headache, and then as you get focal parenchymal involvement, they can have focal neurologic deficits or seizures as well. So here's an illustrative case. This was a child that had significant frontal sinus disease that failed medical management. On T2, you could see an underlying subdural collection. 
contrast enhance, you could see the overlying packing meningeal, underlying leptomeningeal enhancement, separating that subdural collection. Here you could see additional leptomeningeal enhancement extending posteriorly. And then on diffusion-weighted imaging, you could see restricted diffusion associated with the subdural empyema, as well as pyogenic debris within the opacified sinus itself. And then lastly, I want to talk about pot puffy tumor. So this refers to a frontal subperiosteal or subgaleal abscess with associated soft tissue induration and edema. And that soft tissue induration is what is referred to as the pot puffy tumor on clinical presentation. This most often involves children and adolescents, and it's from an underlying frontal sinusitis. Complications include adjacent osteomyelitis, as well as intraorbital and intracranial spread of the infectious process. And like we already talked about, you, you can have orbital or intracranial venous involvement as well. So the treatment is surgical drainage of collections with associated antibiotic therapy. So here's an illustrative case where you could see significant prefrontal edema with a superficial abscess. Clinically, that's gonna be the pop puffy tumor. Underlying, you could see an epidural abscess with associated packing meningeal enhancement, subdural hygroma, and underlying leptomeningeal enhancement. And then on the bone algorithm, here you could see the abnormal lucency with areas of cortical disruption associated with the pop puffy tumor. So in conclusion, I just wanted to emphasize that the diagnosis of inflammatory sinus disease, specifically acute versus chronic sinusitis, is a clinical diagnosis where imaging findings may support that diagnosis. Imaging is really integral in the evaluation of complications associated with inflammatory sinus disease. And then I really wanted to emphasize the importance of evaluating the teeth on all the sinus imaging, and then to look for those early orbital and intracranial manifestations on all of your paranasal sinus imaging studies. So again, I want to thank you for your time. It was a real pleasure being part of this virtual ASHNR meeting. Thank you. Our next speaker is Dr. Mary Beth Kanane from Harvard Medical School and Mass Eye and Ear, who will be speaking about invasive fungal disease. Hi, my name is Mary Beth Kinane, and I'm grateful to have the opportunity to speak with you today about invasive fungal disease, hints to the correct diagnosis. Invasive fungal sinusitis encompasses mostly acute invasive disease and chronic invasive fungal sinusitis, and we're going to be talking about both today. Chronic granulomatous invasive fungal sinusitis is less common, and I won't be discussing it in today's uh, talk. The diagnosis of invasive fungal sinusitis is made at pathology, when the pathologist sees fungal elements outside of the mucosa. The first hint we're going to be talking about today is history is a critical component of the diagnosis. This is not a disease that just anyone gets. There's a certain group of people that are particularly susceptible to invasive fungal disease. When you are not dealing with these groups, you're unlikely to be looking at invasive fungal disease. When you are dealing with these groups, you have to have a very high index of suspicion. So in general, these patients are immunocompromised in some fashion. Um, there are a lot of reasons to be immunocompromised, but among patients with acute invasive fungal disease, the most common patients either have poorly controlled diabetes, usually type 1 diabetes, or hematologic malignancies, with an absolute neutrophil count of less than 500, so they're markedly neutropenic. You can also see this in transplant patients, in HIV patients, but by and large, when you look at large series, the largest groups of people who run into this problem are diabetics and patients with hematologic malignancies. The presenting signs of invasive fungal disease are very similar to the presenting signs of any kind of sinusitis, fever, headache, facial pain, rhinorrhea. In addition, there are a couple of extra signs that if they develop in a patient who is diabetic or is neutropenic, should make you very concerned clinically about invasive fungal disease. And that includes cranial nerve abnormalities, diplopia, frozen globe, visual loss, and proptosis. The typical organisms that are isolated when these patients are cultured are aspergillus and zygomycosis, such as mucor. The pathology shows fungal elements invading beyond the sinonasal mucosa into adjacent soft tissues. And of course, these elements, these fungal elements can also demonstrate vascular invasion. 
On endoscopic exam, what people typically see is devitalized tissue. So the tissue may be pale, there may be an eschar. The surgeon may see frank necrosis on exam. When we look at the radiologic findings, what we see is inflammatory change that's outside of the borders of the sinuses. You can also see bone destruction and evidence of necrosis, which you also often see on MRI as absence of enhancement in a structure that you normally see enhancing, such as the nasal mucosa. So here is a typical case. This is a patient who had a history of hematologic malignancy. You can see severe opacification of the left maxillary sinus, but in addition, there's abnormal soft tissue outside of the confines of the sinus in the preantral soft tissue. There's also abnormal soft tissue in the periantral fat pad. So that fat that's extending around the posterior border of the left maxillary sinus. In addition, you can see some hazy soft tissue on the floor of the orbit. When you look at the bone windows, there's also evidence of bone destruction. And all of these features in this patient with hematologic malignancy are suggestive of invasive fungal disease. Now, when we look at abnormal soft tissue in the fat directly around the maxillary sinus, that's sort of where we expect to see a lot of the findings of invasive fungal sinus disease. But my second hint to give you is that you want to also look at a couple of extra areas that you don't necessarily associate with sinusitis, but are very helpful when you're dealing with invasive fungal disease. And that includes the orbit, the nasopharynx, and the lacrimal sac. The group at University of Florida uh, wrote a great study in uh, 2015 in AJNR where they looked at a comprehensive update of CT findings, and in doing so, they examined 42 pathologically confirmed patients and compared them with 42 controls who were clinically suspected to have invasive fungal disease but did not have invasive fungal disease after pathology. They looked at all of the findings that these patients had on their CT exams, and they measured the sensitivity and specificity of a variety of CT findings. This is a graph that is reproduced in that paper, when you, and it lists all of the areas where they saw abnormality on these cases. But it aligns them according to specificity and sensitivity. On this chart, the sensitivity is the dark bar and the specificity is the light bar. Now, what you can see is sinonasal opacification is seen in the majority of these cases. It's a very sensitive finding for invasive fungal disease, but it's not a very specific finding for invasive fungal disease. As you move up the chart, you see involvement of the brain, including abscess, epidural, fluid collection, arterial thrombosis, subdural collections. These are very specific for the diagnosis of invasive fungal disease, but you can see that they are not very sensitive. At the top of the chart, we have the features that are extremely helpful when you interpret these exams. These are features that are both specific and sensitive, and the group includes involvement of the periantral fat, the pterygopalatine fossa, but also some features that you think of as being associated with the orbit, like the nasolacrimal duct and the lacrimal sac. Bone dehiscence is here. I will also point out that nasopharynx involvement is here, and I will keep that in mind because we're going to see a case of this uh, later on in the talk. They used this table of specificity and sensitivity to make a checklist for acute invasive fungal rhinosinusitis. And this checklist is really helpful when you're looking through these cases. These cases tend to be a little bit stressful to read. A lot of times there is clinical suspicion of the diagnosis and the surgeon is very eager to get to the patient to the OR as quickly as possible. So usually you hear about the patient from a text on your phone before you even see the images. When you're in that kind of stressful situation, a check like the checklist like this can be extremely helpful. You look for periantral fat opacification, bone dehiscence, orbital invasion, 
ulceration of the nasal septum, pterygopaltine phosphopacification, and involvement in the nasal lacrimal duct or lacrimal sac. What this paper showed was that any two of these together predicts acute invasive rungal, fungal rhinosinusitis with 100% specificity and 100% positive predictive value. And that's very helpful in one of these very stressful situations when you're reading these out. So here is a case of a patient who had AML and also had some facial swelling. And what you can see here is that there's a lot of preceptal soft tissue swelling there's some soft tissue swelling just below and anterior to the nasal lacrimal duct. And it looks like there's a septal defect here. Now, when you look at that septal defect, a lot of patients have nasal septal defects. It's, it can be a sort of nonspecific finding. And this patient had a prior history of facial trauma. So it was conceivable that his nasal septal defect could be related to that. But because his... Uh, surgeon for his facial trauma had also been in our institution. We had a preoperative or a, a, we had a prior film that predated his cancer diagnosis on which you could see that the nasal septum was intact. Currently, that nasal septum is absent. On MRI, you can see that there's necrosis where the nasal septum used to be. And in addition, there is abnormal soft tissue in the region of the nasal lacrimal sac. This is two of the findings that are on our checklist, septal ulceration and nasal lacrimal sac involvement. And this patient did have mucormycosis. He went on to surgery and uh, he got systemic antifungal therapy. And you can see that on the left, we have his acute film where there's a lot of soft tissue swelling on the right after treatment, he is significantly improved and this patient did well. Here is another patient with a hematologic malignancy that I read years ago before I really knew to look at the orbit as a sign of, in particular, fungal invasive disease. At the time, I was looking for abnormal soft tissue around the maxillary sinus. I could see the maxillary sinus opacification, but to me, it looked like the pterygopalatine fossa and periantral fat were clean. I thought that there was some soft tissue haziness in the orbit, but I thought maybe that that could be bacterial uh, orbital cellulitis. Fortunately, the clinician suspected otherwise, and she had, went to the OR anyway. This is a couple of weeks later after she's had some debridement, but not debridement involving her orbit. She was on systemic antifungal therapy, but unfortunately her underlying malignancy was uh, getting worse. Here you can see that again, there's a lot of abnormal soft tissue in the orbit. It's significantly worse than on the prior exam. But at this time, later in the course of her illness, you can also see involvement of the pterygopalatine fossa and the periantral fat. But the point is that here, if I had recognized the orbital findings earlier, I would have been able to suggest the diagnosis earlier. Again, in this case, it didn't matter. There was a very strong clinical suspicion. So fortunately, she was taken to the OR and the diagnosis was made that way. Treatment in acute invasive fungal sinusitis involves surgical debridement of necrotic tissue, systemic antifungal therapy, and to the extent that it's possible, treatment of underlying risk factors. And primarily what this relates to is in the patients who have a history of diabetes, bringing them into the hospital and correcting that underlying abnormal sugar so that they can have their immune function improve. It's unfortunately still a disease that confers a high risk of mortality. Probably the largest study that's looked at mortality in patients with invasive fungal disease was published in the laryngoscope in 2013. They looked at 807 published cases across the literature and found a mortality rate of 50.3%. Now, one of the things that's a little hard to tease out when you look at this larger study is how much of that is related to invasive fungal disease and how much of that is related to the underlying uh, risk factor that the patient had. So for example, some more recent studies, which are also large, though not, uh, over, not with hundreds of patients, 
have shown an improved disease-specific survival now that there are better systemic antifungal medications. Uh, in 2019, a group at, the, at UCSF published a group, uh, 55 patients who had invasive fungal sinusitis and ophthalmologic complaints, and they found that the death rate due to infection specifically was 24%. They did have a death rate of closer to 50% if you counted not only the patients who had died as a result of invasive fungal disease, but also the patients who had succumbed to their underlying illness. In some cases, when patients with hematologic malignancy get invasive fungal disease, it's the last of a long series of complications that they've had. And especially if any kind of very morbid surgery is discussed as a treatment, Sometimes at this point, families will decide that it's better to turn to palliative care. Now, because these, because these patients have a, such a high mortality with invasive fungal disease, it tends to be a pretty stressful diagnosis to make, and there tends to be a rush to the OR. However, there is a group of patients who doesn't have such an acutely awful presentation. And one of the things to keep in mind is my hint number three, just because the clinical course isn't acute doesn't mean it's not invasive fungal disease. So there is a subgroup of patients who have chronic invasive fungal disease. These are patients who have a clinical course of more than four weeks where they've sort of been tooling along with something that turns out to be invasive fungal disease. So you shouldn't ignore what you're looking at if the patient has a long history. This is just such an example. This is a patient who went into an outside hospital. He had a history of poorly controlled diabetes. He had uh, sinus symptoms, symptoms of sinusitis, and he was believed, based on his clinical presentation, to have bacterial sinusitis, and he was treated for bacterial sinusitis, but he was also admitted and his diabetes was brought under a degree of control. At the time of his original exams, if you look carefully, there is a little bit of abnormal soft tissue anterior to the left maxillary sinus here. About a month later, he came into our institution complaining of persistent symptoms of sinusitis. When we saw him at that time, the abnormal soft tissue anterior to the left maxillary sinus was certainly worse and there is now new abnormal soft tissue in the periantral fat pad. In addition, there is bone destruction along the anterior face of the left maxillary sinus extending into the palate. An MRI was performed, and here you can see the absence of that bony region in the horizontal palate. Instead, you see abnormal soft tissue essentially replacing the palate. It, this is an, sort of interesting. You know, a lot of times when we look at MRIs for invasive fungal disease, we think that necrosis would be the only thing we would see. This is a patient who clearly has involvement of the palate, but there isn't necrosis yet. And that doesn't mean that he doesn't have invasive fungal disease. Perhaps because his diabetes has sort of been managed this whole time, even though he wasn't getting systemic antifungal therapy, he had a more prolonged course that was more insidious and not as uh, deadly uh, right up front. At this point, he was uh, biopsied. Uh, the biopsy demonstrated invasive mucor, and he was treated with systemic antifungals and some degree of debridement. This is another patient who ultimately presented to us with chronic fungal disease, but this is his film from one year previous to his presentation to us. At that time, he had a lot of sinonasal congestion, and you can see that there is complete opacification of his paranasal sinuses, but also his nasal cavity. The sinuses are opacified by this very high-density material, this very thick, dense mucin. There are some calcifications within the maxillary sinus, and there's also mucosal formation, and all of these are features of allergic fungal sinusitis. So at that time, he was taken to the OR, and all of this uh, thick allergic mucin was taken out, and he, was extensive, he had extensive surgery to clean out his sinuses. Uh, 
but he represented to us about a year later. And by the time he came to us, he'd had a one month history of left orbital pain and also vision loss. On this MRI that was performed when he came into us, you can see now that his paranasal sinuses are actually pretty good looking and the mucus seals in his anterior ethmoids have resolved. But if you look at the left orbital apex, instead of the normal fat that you can see in the contralateral right orbital apex, you see infiltration of abnormal soft tissue. And it does approach the optic nerve on the left. After contrast administration, you can see that there is intermediately enhancing soft tissue around a non-enhancing central component that demonstrates restricted diffusion. At the time that they went into the operating room to investigate this, they evacuated an abscess in the orbital apex, and ultimately the cultures grew out invasive aspergillus. So this is a chronic presentation of invasive aspergillus in someone who had previously had allergic fungal rhinosinusitis. He was uh, treated with systemic antifungals and although his vision did not completely recover, he did do well. The final hint I wanna share with you today is that a lot of times the treating clinicians will suspect invasive sinus disease, but very occasionally the radiologist needs to be the one who recognizes the significance both of what he or she is looking at and the clinical risk factors to make the diagnosis. So, Earlier in my career, I always felt that, you know, the, the surgeons knew that it was invasive fungal disease before I did, and I was just confirming their diagnosis. But over the past couple of years, my colleagues have had a couple of cases where they've made a great diagnosis that the clinicians did not expect, and it was because they recognized what they were looking at, and they looked at the clinical medical record and decided that this was a patient who was at risk. So this is the first example of this. This was a patient with AML. He was severely neutropenic. He was really, really sick. And up to this point had been diagnosed with PE and a number of other abnormalities. He had change in mental status and his mental status was poor enough that he really wasn't complaining of too much. He also had facial swelling, but because he had thrombotic complications elsewhere, including uh, his pulmonary embolism, it, the clinicians just weren't clear on whether he had a cavernous sinus fistula, or excuse me, a cavernous sinus thrombosis, or really what was going on. This was actually a head CT, which is why it's not as high resolution as you'd expect from a sinus CT. And one of my colleagues looking at this head CT realized that she was dealing with somebody who was markedly neutropenic and realized also that there were abnormalities with abnormal soft tissue in the orbit with hazy soft tissue and also enlargement of the inferior rectus muscle. And in addition, there was abnormal soft tissue in the region of the left nasal lacrimal sac. So if you think back to our checklist, if you were concerned that the patient had invasive fungal disease, and the patient has a hematologic malignancy and is very neutropenic, so really you, they're a prime candidate for it. These two findings together would give you a 100% positive predictive value for invasive fungal disease in the right clinical setting. So she called the uh, clinical team and said, I think that this could be fungal disease. I think that's why this patient has facial swelling. I'll point out that she was able to make that diagnosis despite the fact that there really isn't a whole lot of sinonasal opacification here. Certainly there is some opacification of the left maxillary sinus and left sphenoid sinus with air fluid levels, but it's really not flagrant sinonasal opacification. It's the recognition of the orbital findings that guided the diagnosis. He went on to get an MRI. Um, his mental status was still poor, so this had to be a pretty rapid acquisition, which is why the images, although diagnostic, are not gorgeous. And what you can see here is the classic black turbinate sign of invasive fungal disease, where instead of having a normally brightly enhancing uh, nasal turbinate, as you do on the contralateral right side, you have total absence of enhancement of both the middle and inferior turbinate. If you look at the orbit, you can also see that uh, there's a normal lateral rectus muscle in the left orbit, which is avidly enhancing, and then the arrow is demonstrating 
absence of enhancement of the medial rectus muscle due to invasive fungal disease. This patient was incredibly ill already. This was the last in a long series of insults, and he unfortunately uh, succumbed to his underlying cancer. This next case was another situation in which a very astute radiologist was able to make the diagnosis. This patient was a 14-year-old boy who had diabetes who was found down at home. When he came in, his blood sugar level was incredibly high, but he also had some neurological deficits. He had a non-contrast brain MRI, and you can see that there's restricted diffusion and a watershed distribution between the ACA and MCA distributions on the left. On the MRA, you can see that there are regions of stenosis in the left internal carotid artery here and here. This is the raw data from the MRA, where again, you can see narrowing of the left internal carotid artery. Now, this was a non-contrast brain MRI. We really don't get a good look at what the contrast opacification of the soft tissues looks like. You can see that there's a lot of synonasal opacification and also opacification in the nasopharynx. And then if you look carefully at the left longus coli muscle, it's a little bright compared to the right longus coli muscle. To be honest, I would never have noticed this. Um, but if I go back, I think that you can maybe wonder if there's something going on here. He continued to do worse and was getting invas investigated for vasculitis as a cause of his uh, arterial narrowing and stroke. And at the time when he had this contrast enhanced image, the radiologist after finishing the brain looked down into the nasopharynx and saw this large region of non-enhancement in the left nasopharynx. Recall that when we think of some of the findings that the University of Florida group found in their checklist of uh, CT findings in invasive fungal disease, one of the regions that could be involved was the nasopharynx. So the uh, radiologist reading this out put everything together, said, you know what, this is a patient who is diabetic, who came in with very high sugars. I am looking at a huge region of necrosis in the nasopharynx, and maybe the arterial narrowing I see is arterial invasion by underlying invasive fungal disease. The child was taken to the OR, and mucor was identified in, invasive mucor was identified on biopsy. Unfortunately, he went on to develop cerebritis in association um, with his with his intracranial findings, and unfortunately, he did die of invasive fungal disease. But this was a really excellent example of how sometimes a radiologist putting together the findings that they're seeing, even if they're in an unusual location, together with the history of the patient can make the diagnosis that ties everything together. So I want to end with some takeaway points for acute invasive fungal disease. It occurs most commonly in diabetics and hematologic malignancies, and you have to be on the alert for it in these patients. And I do think that these last two cases demonstrate that sometimes these patients are just so sick that they have a myriad of signs and symptoms of a variety of things. And sometimes the clinician, it's just challenging to sort it all out. So if you're the one who's looking at findings that would make you otherwise think of invasive fungal disease, and you recognize the right that the patient has those risk factors, you can be the one to make the diagnosis. It's also important to remember that invasive fungal disease can be acute or chronic, as we saw in the middle two cases where patients had more than four weeks of history. So a history of multiple weeks of symptoms doesn't exclude the diagnosis if you're looking at the typical findings. Finally, many of the important findings are outside of the sinus. So it's sort of ironic, but when you're dealing with acute invasive fungal rhinosinusitis, some of the places to look are not the sinuses at all, but the fat pads around the sinus, the nasopharynx, the orbit, and the lacrimal sac and nasolacrimal duct. When you see abnormalities in these regions in the correct patient, it should alert you to the possibility of invasive fungal sinusitis. Thank you very much for your attention. And I hope that you enjoy the rest of the conference.